Caroline, you're on. You're watching Carolina. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> all right, we gotta go. Thank Thanks you. so much, Elvis. Have a good show. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now we're recording, so ready to go. So yeah. Curse words. You got oh, it's the internet. We can say whatever we want. <laughs> yes, please do. Well, I encourage cursing. <laughs> mm. Okay, so I have a little list of questions here. Now, I was thinking, you guys, I, um, I want to avoid mentioning any names where people might be sensitive, like... Um, you know, in watching the documentaries, because I just rewatched um, Purgatory, and then I watched um, yesterday. I was watching. I told Holly, Jason, I was watching West of Memphis. So when you watch that, you really come to some definite conclusions. And I thought, okay, but I don't want to name any names that are going to ruffle any feathers <laughs> by psychopaths. So, um, <laughs> so I'll just kind of skirt around certain certain topics, but. Um, Okay, I'm now good and respectful because um I, I never wanted to point the finger at anybody anyway and we yeah. we're or the foundation of our judicial system is the presumption of innocence. Yeah. So if, if that's our first step, yeah, and we ignore it, yeah. well, of course there's never going to be justice in the yeah. case. So well, we don't do the same thing to anyone else that was done to Damien, Jesse, and myself. So right, that's why it's so important to. You know, push for the case to be reopened and have a real investigation to yeah. follow the evidence instead mm -hmm. of having an idea of who we want. Yeah. Well, person. without saying anything um, incriminating, do you do you have an idea? Do you have your own ideas of who or how you think the those murders might have happened in just in your I, I, own mind? No, I, because um, as, as the years have gone by, I've heard from so many different, you know, experts. Yeah. You know, starting with the state's experts and heard, and heard so many different theories that I don't know what to believe. The only mm -hmm. thing I know for with any certainty is that I'm innocent, yeah. and that's the only thing I can say. Yeah. You know, I'm not trained in any of these fields, so I refuse to, you know, mm -hmm. develop an opinion, you know, on any of the things I've heard because yeah. I don't know that these people aren't doing, you know, much more than anyone else and just guessing based yeah. on, you know, what they see. Yeah. Well, that's that's smart thinking. I guess you can't exactly come out of there, come out of prison and go, I know, I have a theory. I think I think I know who did it. So now, uh, well, let's start. We'll talk a little bit about the uh, years where you were in prison. And um, I don't want to spend too much time on that because I know in the last two years, how many hundreds of interviews have you given? You must have given like hundreds, right? And uh -oh. Who knows? Yeah. He used, to, he used to keep track of how many flights he had been on, and that stopped about, I don't know, two weeks in or something. Oh my God. So, God. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. After about 40 something flights, somewhere <laughs> counts. Oh my God. Yeah. Interviews. Done yeah. Well, well for, it's, first of all, you know, I, I was thinking, I could just sit here and look at the two of you. Like, let me just look at you, because you're both, you're so adorable. But um, let me let me ask you, now, when you, um, what has it been like for you to, because you spent your formative years in prison. Okay. Then, then coming out, though, it was like, like you're a time traveler. What is that like walking into the digital age with the Internet? What, did, you know, what kind of things were you thinking? And how freaked out were you? God, that must have been really weird. It's, it's different for me because it's not necessarily time travel for me because um, I'm, I'm, I've always made sure to keep my finger on the pulse, so to speak, to steal a quote from one of my supervisors. Yeah. Uh, on technology, it started as a kid, you know, with Atari and worked my way up to Nintendo, Super Nintendo, and then while inside, I, I, in prison, I, I, after I got my GED, I was able to get jobs working in the, in the count room, working mm. in the school, working as a field majors clerk, and all these jobs gave me access to computers, and I had to use computers to do my daily job. Oh, okay. Check okay. databases, building databases, uh, memos, inter-office memos. And, he just and got whatever. through replacing the hard drive in his MacBook. <laughs> oh, yeah, my MacBook. It, you know, so. when, when I got out, um, they, John Harden, who 
uh, help, help, um, who just co-founded um, Proclaim Justice with me. He yeah. gave me a refurbished uh, MacBook Pro to mid-2010. Oh, and cool. it got so slow, you click an app and like two minutes later, some of them would pop up, you know. <laughs> so I had a hard drive, you know, a disk drive. So I replaced that with a solid state drive and now it just it runs fine. Oh, I mean, God. Art, you can see probably behind us this speaker. Like he set up this whole entertainment system oh my and God, you're I, I don't even know how to use it. Like he's so <laughs> such a savant. I, I have everything just running on um Apple yeah. instead of uh, PC and Microsoft, which is what I was used to in the state because everything in there is run on Office, Microsoft, and PC. So that was the system I learned in there. So when I got out and I was given the MacBook, I had to learn Apple. Oh my god, you're such a whiz kid. God. So you so you could they offered classes in prison, like you could continue your education in there, is that right? Yeah, definitely. Um really? state law now that if you in, in Arkansas, I don't know about Washington or any of the other states yeah. much, but Arkansas now. It it wasn't when I went in, but it's state law if you don't have your high school diploma that you must be working towards it, yeah. you know, some shape, form or fashion and, and you know, have it before you're released. You yeah. actually taught Classes in, in, school, yeah. in the GED school, I helped guys get their GEDs and stuff. Oh, God, that's you know, going up for parole, and it was parole stipulated that they had their GED or high school diploma. So, yeah. a lot of guys from ages of 15 and 16 to, you know, I helped one guy who was in his 70s, you know, learn to read. He had never oh, needed okay. to read and never needed a higher education because oh. he just grew up as a farm hand all his life. So. Isn't that amazing? It is. You're like the angel of the prison. How did you, how come they put you, why did they not put you in a juvenile facility? How come they put you in the slammer with all the, like the hardcore dudes? Well, in the state of Arkansas, um, part one of the laws is um, the prosecutor, has and as soon as you're charged with a crime, they have a um, motion put forth from the judge whether to charge you with the crime as a juvenile or move it to uh, adult court. And yeah. one of the things that can make it automatic is the nature of the crime and the crime itself and capital murder. You know, I think I think Arkansas has a history of the age of 14, the earliest age of 14, to charge you with that, and you automatically go into the adult system. After you're out of the jail, it, it, when, when I was in the jail, the county jail waiting trial, I was in the juvenile system, in the juvenile side. Yeah. But then yeah. once I was convicted after the trial, they sent me to the adult prisons. Oh, my God. Yeah. What but I had to spend, when, when you first go there in the state of Arkansas, you go in front of the diagnostics unit, and that's where they evaluate you physically and mentally to determine, you know, which prison they're going to send you to. Because they have many prisons in, in of varying degrees, but um, yeah. yeah. In, unless you're on death row, which you don't go through that process, you automatically go to death row. Oh. You know, which at that time in '94, mm -hmm. which at the end of in my trial, um, death row was at the Tucker Maximum Security Unit. Oh my God! Which God. is where Holly met me at years yeah. later. Not on death row, thank God. <laughs> oh, I think. I didn't live in that barracks. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God! Well, yeah. how are where were you when they arrested you? Were you, um, did they just come and like scoop you up off the street? Like Jason Baldwin, come with us. How did that happen? Did they come um, to your house? I asked the school for the 10th grade. Um, I was at Damien's house. It was his sister, him, um, Dominique, which, you know, was the mother of their child. Yeah. Seth. And, um, we were watching movies. We were watching, um, a, a leprechaun. <laughs> um, Damien's parents had Splash Casino had just opened up in Tunica. It was supposed to be, you know, the new Las Vegas, you know, so they're going to that. <laughs> Leprechaun, isn't that with Jennifer Aniston? It's like that horrible movie. Yeah, yeah. So actually, somebody, um, her name's Kristen Smith, she gave him. Uh, I, we still, I still haven't finished watching that yeah, movie. Yeah, he never finished it, right? Because they arrested him. And also, she gave him a copy. This is like right not too long after he got out, so we have that. Yeah. Maybe we'll finish it. Yeah, we have a bunch of movies we're playing catch yeah. up on, so that, that will be funny. funny. She yeah. is scared of scary movies, so. I like, you know what? That one's campy enough that yeah. I can handle it. Yeah. Like, the, the really scary ones, I can't. I can't hang. I know, but yeah, but watch Leprechaun. It's hilarious. It's really bad. I've, I've seen it actually. Oh, okay. Um, oh, okay. At some, like with my sister when I was like, you know, eight. That that's good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you guys were at Damien's house, and then the cops came there. Or what happened? Yeah, and, and before um, Cam and Joe left, that's Damien's parents. You know, at, at this time they're probably younger than I am mm -hmm. now. You know, and um, 
you know, in the prime of their life and everything. But um, they, they had told us, you know, if the police came there, you know, to act like we weren't there since they weren't going to be there because mm-hmm. they had been harassing Damien, you know, since the, before the murders, really. Yeah. And yeah. they had come and take, taken photos of him, made him take his shirt off and everything God. and take photos of him. Like, and take him down to the police station. So they're like, we're not going to be here. You know, we're going to go out. We're, we're going to have some fun and everything. You know, you guys will sit here, sit tight. If they come up, just act like they're not here until they go away. And, then, you know, just hang tight. Mm-hmm. So that's what we did, you know. And they showed up and um, we turned the lights out and everything. And they were like, we know you're there. We saw you turn the lights out. And I'm like, oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we well, were just doing what we were told. So, you know, we opened the doors, let them in. They were like, I mean, you're arrested for murder, and then they were like, Jason Mullen, you are too. No way. I can't believe that. And, oh, my God. And, and it's in the, like, this flow and dream form, format, like, things that's got real slow and mm-hmm. just really weird. It, you know, it's, it, you just get... You know, that's weird. God, your mothers must have been in hysterics. Your, your mothers must have, like, flipped out, didn't they? Oh, my God. Your poor oh, mom. Man. I well, didn't see my mom for several weeks, and um, mm-hmm. she actually went to every single jail in the state of Arkansas several different times and went to the jail where I'd eventually be held at, and they had told her that I wasn't there. So, in effect, for her, I was kidnapped. Oh, so that boy. was all in 1993, Gosh. right? And you you started your prison sentence in 94, right? Yeah, that... that, that county jail. County jail. Oh, county that jail. summer that I was supposed to get, like... Um, see, that my last day of school was that Thursday. I was supposed to start... Second groceries at Kroger that Monday, mm-hmm. and uh, Miss Littleton, the lady who lived next door to us, she was gonna match me dollar for dollar on new clothes and <laughs> a car and things like that. And um, I was going out with this girl who was a um, cheerleader, not Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got the ring. Yes. <laughs> so, so you know, I was looking forward to impressing her, you know, with the car and job and having money and responsibilities and stuff. But instead, I'm sitting in the jail, you know. He's even gonna get a haircut. Oh my yeah. god! Which no. I ended up getting anyway. But <laughs> oh no! So, is it? Um, uh, were there? It's amazing though. Like watching those documentaries, it's amazing how. Um, how many people come forward now and say, oh, you know what? I was lying back then when I was on the witness stand. Sorry. How how do those people not have to pay any consequences? Like, especially when they're lying under oath in a court of law. How how does that work? That's just so, it's really odd to me. The way I look at it is, I, I, I can kind of understand just coming from the, those people in those situations, you know, because they were in hopeless and dire situations. You look at, we'll, we'll speak of them specifically, um, Vicki Hutchison. Mm-hmm. She's a young mother. I think she's younger than what we are now, you Probably, know. Probably, yeah. Um, yeah. Down on her luck, I don't, I don't know, you know, the exact details of what her family life and her personal business was, but I believe she was a single mother, you know, doing the best she could and everything, and she had gotten into trouble you know, at her at her job, you know, with some hot checks and the police, you know, instead of being sympathetic and helping her, you know, navigate, you know, these this trouble she was in, yeah. they used that to pressure her, you know, in effect, you know, they threatened to take her eight year old son away and, and put him in, you know, Department of Human Services and lock her up in prison if she didn't come up with something. Mm-hmm. So the you know, in, in absence of finding anything real and substantial, she just made stuff up mm-hmm. in order to save her son. So do I blame her for doing what she could to save her son in, in a hopeless situation? No. Yeah. Um, the authorities who put her into that situation, who pressured her into mm-hmm. doing that and put her in, her in that hopeless situation, that's who the blame falls on. That's who was responsible yeah. for that. They, they were supposed to protect her and protect all of us in that whole you know, tragic mm-hmm. ordeal, yeah. and they did. Well, right. is the so the would you say the driving force, like on the on part on the part of the prosecution, was it just to hurry, hurry, and find someone that they can blame, and at all costs, and just like round up any people who were you know willing to go on the stand and kind of um, I don't know, had the prosecution kind of made up a story of their own and then gotten people to, uh, you know, to like speak out along those lines, you know what I'm saying? Like, okay, we've got a story, and can you go on the stand and kind of repeat what we're telling you? I mean, it sound, it's 
uh, was having an honest debate and discussion with the prosecution mm -hmm. and, and the state and the judge and everyone who and the detectives who worked on the case at that time. Yeah. I don't know yeah. if they really believed we were guilty or if they really were sinister and, and did what they did, you know, with the knowledge they were in that mm -hmm. we were innocent. But regardless of their ultimate belief on the practices they they used weren't constitutional, weren't fair, and, and did produce an unjust result. And it's those practices that they should definitely be held accountable for. Right. Accountable right. for and those practices should not go on regardless of what their initial belief mm -hmm. were. I think, you know, you know, when you look at Jerry Driver, for example, he's, I think, in Western Memphis as well. Um, and he, I think, still says he thinks they're guilty. He had this idea that satanic activity was going on in West Memphis, which was part of a broader satanic panic across the country at that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he essentially, when the murders occurred, said, I've been waiting for something like this to happen. I knew it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I know that Dan Anichols was involved. I mean, it was sort of from the jump. He had this narrative, I think, uh, in his head. And so when, after a month of no leads, when they lost the evidence from the Bojangles restaurant, which was really the only substantial lead that they had, I think they latched on to this story. And as Jason said, it's sort of unclear whether or not they truly believed what they were purporting. Yeah. But there's no question that there was a narrative that folks were led down. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some were more on the bandwagon than others, I guess. But I mm -hmm. think... At the end of the day, even Jesse Miss Kelly was fed information about the crime as part of his false confession. So yeah. there's no doubt that Which there was. Which is you know, part of you know another problem of, of our own um, judicial system is the read method, you know, of interrogation. You know, part of it is you know to give you know whoever it is they're interrogating pieces of the crime like in multiple choice fashion and let them pick it out. You know, and, and first of all, they put them in a position. Of least culpability, mm -hmm. in, but they make sure they put them in the situation after they make sure that person is, is, is succumbed to hopelessness. Yeah. Because first yeah. they make sure that the person has opportunity to talk and tell their side of the story as much as they need to, and then the police refuse yeah. to accept the truth. There's a whole, I mean, yeah. pages and pages and pages of a how to yeah. essentially on this method that, and it's perfectly legal. It's used all the time, mm. and it produces, I mean, 25% of all wrongful convictions in this country involve a false confession. So, it's a and, real and no telling how many others there are that never get found That's out. right, yeah. Mm. So, Gosh. 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 All that in practice. Yeah. yeah. So. Michael Carson, the kid who lied on me, right. you know, said I test testified to him that I committed the crime when it never occurred. Mm -hmm. he, he was, you know, this kid who was a career criminal at the young age who, you know, the prosecution gave him an opportunity to get out of jail and out of prison. All he had to do was lie on someone. Oh, and he did it over and over, right? Yeah. Was, this was not the only case that he yeah. uh, testified yeah. wrongfully yeah. in. So. And he got run out of California. Really? Uh, he did? Yeah. Yeah. After, after, after that time. Mm -hmm. he, he, there, you know, Brent Davis, who was the prosecutor in our case, um, lent him to California and to their uh, judicial system, and they just sent him out. Yeah. It's a criminal uh, element and just gave him a, a, a pass to do whatever he wanted. Yeah. Free of charge, yeah. so to speak. And all he had to do was just reel in other people and, and create stories. Gosh, that's yeah. amazing. Well, the the amount of time, the 18 years that, that, um, that you were in prison 18 the 18 years how uh what is the explanation because all three of you um you tried to get new trials and you tried to have new information looked at and you were trying all kinds of different ways everything possible to um you know to expedite your exoneration and it just seems like did the people on the outside who maybe the papers that were shuffling across whoever's desk did those people not care, or how do you explain the, the length of time? Why did it take so long? Over and, and over, what we encountered with, with the state Supreme Court and with Judge Burnett was that they ruled that the convictions you know, had merit mm -hmm. because they had evidence to rely upon. Mm -hmm. But 
the evidence they were relying upon, uh, Michael Carson's testimony, Vicki Hutchinson's testimony, uh, uh, Justin Kelly's confession, all these different things were all false and right. lies. Mm-hmm. So once you knock those things out of the equation, then, of course, the conviction can't stand, but they refuse to allow mm-hmm. that to mm-hmm. happen. And they did have, you know, physical evidence, These this fiber evidence that has since been debunked, the science on that was completely wrong, the knife yeah. in the lake, mm-hmm. which we know was thrown into the lake a year prior to the murders. So they had, not only did they have that, but they had this sort of cache of really erroneous physical evidence mm-hmm. to, to bolster their case in a way that... And, you know, the other thing, too, that I think folks fail to realize a lot is that... So you hear a lot of people say... For example, well, people will get off on appeal. You know, if, if they're innocent, they'll get off on appeal. Mm-hmm. But the truth of our system is that once you're convicted, well, really, once you're you're arrested and once you're charged. Once you're labeled as a suspect. But even mm-hmm. beyond that, once mm-hmm. you're convicted, it is so difficult mm-hmm. because you can't present what you presented in your original trial. In appeal, all you can do is raise new issues right. or question the way that the trial was done. And so I think that's something that people are not all that aware of. Mm-hmm. But this is not unique to their case. I mean, cases across this country, once someone's convicted, the appeals process is arduous and it takes forever. But wow. part of the problem is the bar is set so high. That is that horrifying. It's almost impossible. It's horrifying. So that means, is that, so anyone, anywhere could just be in the wrong place at the wrong time. You don't even have to be in the wrong place. You can be in the right place at the right time. That is absolutely horrifying, you guys. Oh, God. And someone could say you were in Timbuktu and and make up a believable story about it without a shred of evidence, and you will succumb to it. And you don't have to be, you know, in their case, we know this sort of Metallica element, you know, the interest in the (laughs) occult or whatever. Yeah. Uh, typically in this country, if you're black and poor or a combination of those two or, you know, all of these different elements really put you at a disadvantage in our justice system. But I recently, with the Ryan Ferguson case, I've been saying this a lot to folks because Mm -hmm. this kid was, you know, upper middle class, I think, you know, somewhere in there. He wasn't poor. He was white. He -hmm. was, you know, sort of preppy. I mean, all he was the all-American guy, right? Mm -hmm. And this still happened to him. He spent, I think, 10 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. And he wasn't even there when it happened. So if it could happen to that kid, it could happen to anybody. Oh, my God. That is truly horrifying. Well, Jason, let me ask you, what, what, is, um, what is the status now on the hope for exoneration? Is there any hope? Or tell me what's going on with yeah, that. Um, my attorneys, um, John Phillips Ford and Blake Hendricks, are working diligently, mm-hmm. you know, doing what they can as private attorneys, you know, without the subpoena power of the state, Mm -hmm. you know, to work on the case and everything. And they're in communications with Scott Ellington and and everybody. So it's definitely hopeful. Um, Damien has not been executed and Mm -hmm. not going to be executed. So what could have been hopelessness has been passed and we've been able to sidestep that. So now there's hope, you know, we can, there's time, you know, the state can do the right thing. Mm Mm-hmm. So they can do it right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nothing to stop them. So. So your attorneys are on it. They're on the. They're working on that, and it's just um, more waiting. You just have to wait, like, and be, it, it be patient. Just really, um, all in the power of Scott Ellington, uh, uh, Dustin McDaniel, and um, Governor Beebe. Yeah. It's all yeah. all the powers in their mm-hmm. hands. All they have to do is just make the decision. Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, let me ask you too. When while you were in prison for that long period of time, how did you stay so pulled together? Because you did spend your formative years there. You were just sixteen, and you your formative years went by while you were in you know the penitentiary. So how did you? What was your source of, of being grounded and uh, being so optimistic? I have faith in God, and, mm-hmm. and, and I have strong faith, but initially, you know, I had the love and support of my family, you know, my mother, brothers, mm-hmm. and my extended family, and my friends, you know, who knew where I was at and everything, so I had all this support, you know. Yeah. The courts didn't allow any of that to be shown in the courtroom or any of that, but it was there, so that gave me strength. Okay, yeah. Just yeah. that support, and then later on, because we did, you know, agree to allow HBO to film the trials. Mm-hmm. Thank God, you know, Joe and Bruce 
came down there and filmed them. You know, other people saw what happened and, and recognized, you know, the kangaroo court for what it was and, and mm -hmm. saw us get railroaded, saw us get railroaded and, mm -hmm. you know, came and rallied to our support, you know, from people from the world over. So that gave more, you know, hope and strength, you know. Okay. You, you know, Holly loves this quote, you know, the Martin Luther King mm -hmm. Jr. quote. You can go ahead and say it. <laughs> <laughs> The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Oh. You, you always want to believe that. You, you do. Know? I know. You do. Some situations, you always want to believe that, and you want to carry yourself with a certain amount of dignity and yes. grace, no matter how bad people are acting around you for no reason whatsoever. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, so two years ago on that August day, I forgot the date, but two years ago, you you were in the prison and you guys were transported to that hearing with um, Judge Taser, and and after that hearing, you were instantly what? What What'd you say his name was? Pardon me, I didn't hear correctly. Isn't no. it Taser? Is that his name? Oh no no, it's Laser. Uh, oh Laser. Laser. <laughs> <laughs> You've been tasered. Oh no, how embarrassing! I'll have to edit that. So. <laughs> yeah. Judge Phaser. <laughs> yeah, watch out. Judge Taser. <laughs> Taser. Oh, it's Laser. Sorry, Judge. Excuse me, Judge Laser. <laughs> what, what was the little Martian's name on, on Looney Tunes? <laughs> Marvin Martian. 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 Yeah. I know. But, oh, I was trying to figure out where you were going with Judge that. Judge Laser. Laser. Okay, yeah. got it. Okay, yeah. David Laser. Excuse me. Sorry, Your Honor. <laughs> if you're listening. Yeah, uh, after Judge Laser, um, you know, finished the proceedings and, and uh, you guys were free to go, you went from, so you went from the prison to that hearing with Judge Laser, and then you were outside. What did that feel like? What did that feel like? What was going through your head? Well, it was so much different. I mean, it was so much positively different. I'm sorry. It's okay. Holly. Holly. <laughs> oh, yeah, I should say I have a terrible cold, and... Really? Uh, oh. My boss told me the other day that I sound like a seal. So no, you I don't. <laughs> no, you don't. You don't sound like a seal. <laughs> I love seals. <laughs> don't worry. I'll edit out the, the coughing. So don't okay. worry. <laughs> I just didn't want to, he's always so brilliant. I don't want to interrupt him right in the middle of something. Mm. Terribly so, go ahead, no, no. I need coffee now. No. Where were we at? Uh, Judge Laser, <laughs> Judge Laser. Oh no, yeah. When you, when you, Judge uh, Laser uh, handed down the. Um, Judge Laser, instead of Judge Burnett. You know, we, we'd experienced Judge Burnett denying every single thing. You know, from from the pretrial motions of, in the original trial mm. on. You know, mm -hmm. and, and and I hoped that he would be fair and had every reason to believe that he would be fair. So. I was hoping that um, once he vacated the convictions and before he accepted the pleas, that he would um, just take a monumental leap forward and, and yeah. let us go yeah. outright, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. tell the state that they didn't have enough, you know, to support any conviction and that he, he wouldn't allow even an Alfred plea to stand. Oh, gosh. That's what I was hoping. Yeah. Honestly, I almost didn't just told him I couldn't do it. I know that I yes I yes that's also been uh, documented um, again and again that you were you were not in favor of taking the deal. How long did you need to kind of think it over and change your mind? How what was that time frame? There wasn't a lot of time to begin with. Yeah, I, I first heard you know I heard the offer was on the table when I came in from work. I was working in school. I was getting ready, getting the school ready to start for the new year, and um. This was on May, let's see, August 10th, mm -hmm. which was a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. I come in from work at about 4.30, and um, the barracks officer that worked the control booth and everything told me to go back to the main control booth that I had a visit, you know, an attorney visit. Now, normally when I get an attorney visit, I know well in advance mm. whether Blake or John's coming to say, you know, on this date, we're going to come down and see you. We're going to discuss these points, and, you know, it's, yeah. you know very put together and everything. So this was a surprise, so that let me know something was going on automatically, you know. Mm. So I get up there and it's Blake and he tells me, what if I told you you could go home tomorrow? 
<laughs> I'm like, that's great. But, you know, I can hear in his voice and see in his face, you know, there's a butt, you know, there's a catch. You know? <laughs> a huge one, yeah. So yeah. You, you can go home tomorrow. But. 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 <laughs> and he had, you know, the case, you know, two copies of the case printed out, you know, various court rules and, and everything, you know, printed out. And he said, before you say anything, let's just go over it, you know, the legal ramifications of it, which I'd worked in the law library for several years prior to this, and I'd heard of the case before, and I never thought it would be applied mm. in our case, and would never even seek for it to be applied, you know, yeah. it was so yeah. alien and, and, and something that I did not want, you know. So, to humor him, I went over it with him and everything, just to make sure he was doing his job, mm -hmm. and, you know, he did his job, and explained it to me, and, and I told him, you know, no, and he let me know he was proud, you know, <laughs> proud of me, because... You know, we had one an evidentiary hearing for December coming up, you know, and that wasn't too far away, you know, at this point, after serving over 18 years, you know, for me, yeah. you know, I, I'm working in the school, you know, people aren't trying to kill me at this point, you know, <laughs> it's not like when we first went in and, you know, going in and out the courtroom, people are hurling insults and curses and people... I mean, I got the crap beat out of me. I don't know how many times. I got the collarbone broke, skull broke, the worst of it, you know. Aww. So, you know, I went through all these different early phases, you know. God. Just people not knowing that I was innocent, not knowing that Damien was innocent, not knowing that Jesse was innocent. But by this point, you know, everyone I was having contact with, you know, knew I was innocent, knew we were innocent, mm. and uh, had nothing but love and respect and admiration for me. So... My life, yeah, I wasn't at home. I wasn't where I was supposed to be, but still it wasn't, I wasn't in mortal agony every mm, day. Mm -hmm. I wasn't mistreated. I wasn't, you know, being hurt. I wasn't going to sleep at night fearing, you know, something bad was going to happen to mm -hmm. me while I was sleeping. You know? yeah, but you know, it still sucked, you know. You go <laughs> through strip searches when you get a visit, you know, you couldn't go home with your family and everything, you know, and, and you deserve to be home, you know. Mm. I, oh, yeah, the food. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean it, it, it's horrible and it sucks, you know. Mm. But I had a life. I built a life in there, and I was willing to hold out for the uh, uh, evidentiary hearing and hold out, you know, no matter how many more years it yeah. took. It was a for him, it was a no-brainer. He called me that afternoon and yeah. said, hey, they offered me this deal. I'm not going to take it. I said, that's great. I'm so proud of you, and I'll mm. see you on Saturday. Yeah. It was really that simple, you know. It was, it was just no, no question. Yeah. Like, take it until, of course, Lori called me and explained the circumstances and said, you know, it's an all-or-nothing thing and all of that. And at that point... Jason started to consider. Yeah. I saw to her Saturday on the phone and she didn't come to visit. Mm. I was supposed to be there. I was supposed to be yeah. visiting. Mm. Instead, I was meeting with, with Lori and the attorneys. And, uh, you know, I call, I sort of had a very short period of time to think about whether or not. Because, look, Damien had all the Saturday after Wednesday. Yeah. yeah. Mm. He gets on Wednesday on Saturday. Well, Friday night, I get a call from Lori. So Saturday, I'm supposed to be visiting, but instead I'm meeting with her and with the attorneys and have a very short window to decide whether I'm even willing to talk to Jason about this mm -hmm. because uh, at the end of the day, Damien had all the advocates in the world, but I felt like if not Jason's only one of his only advocates for him, you know, and I ultimately decided that even though everything looked like it was going to go really well in December, that very well they could have declared that there wasn't enough evidence for a new trial and let them go right then. It could take another 10 years, but even beyond that. Yeah. I knew, you know, even though the system's supposed to work right, I knew it could still, you know, we could have won another trial that could have been like the original trial. We could have had a jury foreman that was adamant about, or guilt, even without any evidence, and, and was determined to see us found guilty mm -hmm. if no evidence was proffered. Um, we could have had people come up and lie again. They could have marched in new people with new problems, willing that, that they were willing to trade for <laughs> yeah. lies, you know. And, and you know, it could have yeah. been the same thing all over again. Mm -hmm. you know, I knew that. He yeah. did, and it, it's not like I was telling him anything he didn't already know. But for me, as I thought about it, um, I just had to say I don't think that this is a gamble that you can take, you know, yeah. this is a surefire way to get out. And the truth is that 
everybody who already knows you're innocent is not going to second guess it. And anybody who would probably has doubts anyway. Right. Yeah. So it's not going to change public opinion. But the problem was, right, that <laughs> it sets that precedent. It closes the case for investigation as far as the state's concerned. Mm -hmm. And all those things are still true. But ultimately, you know, we had a 15 minute phone conversation in which I told him everything I just told you. And all he heard was Damien is suffering. And he didn't, Mm -hmm. the rest of it, A, he already knew it. And B, he had already weighed that out. And so for him, the wild card was the fact that Damien, I mean, we had sort of kept Damien's real condition from him Mm -hmm. because what's the point of telling him, right? right? There's nothing he can do about it. It's just going to make him worry unnecessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, I've since learned that Jason's nature is to want to know everything, no matter what <laughs> good or bad. Uh, so give him, give him the details and he'll figure it out. If I don't have all the information, I can't make the right decisions. That's right. Yeah. So, so that gave him the right information, even though my intention really wasn't necessarily to give him that information. It was more just to tell him what I thought. Mm from my perspective, is best for him. Yeah. But all he heard was, you know, that Damien is suffering and, and may not make it through the rest yeah. of this process. And that's, you know, I can't say it enough. I mean, it's been mm-hmm. said and it's been told, but yeah. I think it bears repeating that to not only deny two offers at, that are made to you at 16, yeah. that would have seen him, one of them would have seen him out in probably two and a half or three years, no. maybe even, not even 20, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. But to turn those down and then to accept an offer that is really absurd on its face, totally. legally, yeah. yes. more, you know. I kept thinking, why would they do this? You know, why would they do this? It just it just didn't make sense. You know, if they're supposed to be, you know, on the side of justice and what's right, supposed to protect and serve mm-hmm. all of its citizens, you know, why would they put this plea out there and accept it? It just, it was infuriating. And then on the flip side of that is so extraordinary that he did it anyway, you know, and I think it's a real testament to, well, the fact that he refused it in the first place is no bigger evidence of innocence. I don't think you can find, right? Yes. And then to consider someone else's livelihood, um, I don't know, it's just, it's really extraordinary. And I, you know, by doing this, the state was letting me know that they were still going to do everything in their power to kill Damien, you know? Even if it meant lying and cheating again, you know, to save, you know, Gosh. what the price tags got. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was about $60 million. $60 million. You know, but I, think, so. I think there is going to be a time, I really believe this, that there will be a time where it is more of a political liability to not reverse this mm-hmm. and to stay the course. Mm-hmm. And when that happens... I believe that somebody will do the right thing in Arkansas because ultimately it will come down to Arkansas officials and their decisions. Mm-hmm. And I, I have to believe that at some point, and it may be another 18 years, right? I hope not. But I think at some point there will be a sense that it's a political liability to not reverse this terrible wrong when they have the power to do that. Um, so I'm really, I'm hopeful, you know. Yeah, that, yeah, I'm hopeful too, even though, you know, the history of, you know, our justice system in, in America shows us that a lot of times they don't, it, it, if they correct a mistake, it's years later, you know, like with the Scottsboro boys, you yeah, know. that were already long dead after their names yeah. were finally cleared. But God. the good yeah. news is that even though the Alpha plea has placed a lot of barriers in Jason's way and really more importantly in the way of this case yeah. and finding justice for those little boys and their families, mm-hmm we get to do that fight out here. Um, exactly. And, and, there, and that can't, you know, the importance of that, I, I don't think can be overstated. I, mean, I know. It's worth everything that you're on the outside now being able to. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, I was thinking too, it seems like, um, I think you're right, Holly. Don't you think over a period of time that the officials who are, um, who maintain that they made the right decision 18 years ago. Yes, Damien, Jesse, and Jason were guilty. Don't you think that that's going to just, like, gnaw at their insides over time and that they might, one of them or a few might crack and just go, okay, I'm sorry, I made a mistake and I was wrong. I mean... I mean, the problem is that many of those people are still in positions of power and they're, I think, 
afraid of the repercussions yeah. for their careers. Mm-hmm. So it may be that those folks have to be retired before that can happen. You know, I don't know. I mean, I think idea in an ideal world, the morality of this would outweigh any other consequences, but that's just not yeah. the reality. And it should be, you know, politically advantageous for any leader in any political position to be strong enough to say that when, when they realize you know, a mistake was made on their watch, to be strong enough to be able to stand up and say, hey, the mistake was made. Mm-hmm. What do we need to do to solve it? You know, right. Maybe and now, right now, you know? I mean, the people that have the power to do that are not the same people, right? Mm-hmm. So the people that, uh, the judge and the prosecutor, they still have careers that in many ways are based on this case, but the folks that actually have the power to reverse it didn't, have didn't anything. you know, have anything mm-hmm. to do with it. And so, I mean, Scott Ellington said himself, I think that he inherited this case. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like there is an emphasis there, and I... I mean, I hope that, and yeah. I think that ultimately, I I don't I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. You know, I don't know how they sleep. That's um, a good question. Yes, excellent question. How do you sleep at night, you guys? Um, well, yeah. So now, Jason, your the um, your website is called Proclaim Justice, right? Correct. Tell me about that a little bit. How did that start, and what? How can people get involved if they are so inclined? Fairly new and young right now, where we're mm-hmm. we're kind of like a, 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 a giraffe, newborn giraffe, but very <laughs> ungainly and, 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 and clumsy right now. We're, we're trying to get our footing, but um, it, yeah. I, I believe we're trying to do a lot of good um, with without really any input from us. Um, one of our guys, one of the cases we're focused on, Terry Howard, um, Terrence Howard, Tim Howard, Tim Howard. I'm terrible. So bad with names. I know with a T and a Howard. But anyway, Tim Howard um, just had his um, case overturned in Arkansas, who was on death row, and who mm-hmm. we believe was sent on. So he's going to get a retrial here soon. Wow. But, Which is amazing. Let's talk about uh, the, the inception of the organization. So John Harden, who is uh, a great friend of ours and who I met through working on the case. Mm-hmm. Um, My case, um, yeah. yeah. About Arkansas Take Action. Yeah, so Arkansas Take Action in 2007, I think they formed, and I joined up with those guys, and that was led by Cappy Pack and Brent Peterson and Lori Davis in Arkansas, and John Harden was a part of that organization. So after they got out, after the West Memphis Three were released, <clears throat> John still had such a heart for wrongful justice convictions work. and mm-hmm. justice work, and decided he didn't want to stop with just this one case, and so he approached Jason. Uh, I guess this was a, it was, I think it was in 2011, mm-hmm. and with the idea of starting this organization. We didn't have a name for it then, mm-hmm. yeah. or any of that. It, it was just, just a conversation, yeah. and so it grew and, and developed um, a board. And he had also been in touch with um, McCluskey. And- oh, Jim McCluskey, who is sort of, we got to meet him in Toronto. Uh, he's sort of the godfather of innocence. He started the very first innocence organization that in existence called Centurion, Centurion. Ministries. Oh, cool. He was a, a businessman who decided to leave business and go into ministry, and he did one of his internships or, or whatever at a prison and mm-hmm. met a guy who swore up and down that he was innocent mm-hmm. and ultimately he got him out and started this organization. So John has sort of sat at Jim's feet and gleaned a lot of this knowledge and proclaimed justice is really sort of modeled after the work that Centurion is doing. And, um, yeah. And so we hope to help other innocent people who are in prison, you know, not be put in prison, you know, if we hear of their cases before they go on trial, or if they are in prison, you know, bring political, you know. Jason, you're so, you're such a noble guy. You're such a noble guy. Like, the minute you were out, you started caring, you just turned right around and, you know, started helping other people who are in the same situation. You're just, you know, really... Well, I didn't enjoy what I went through, and I don't want to see anybody (laughs) else going through it, so... (laughs) <laughs> Anything I can do. Yeah. You know, well, help, he, you know. he may tell about the privacy day, dudes. You know, I grew up with a lot of guys in there, and I, you know, some of them are, you know, a lot of them guilty for what they did. The majority of them, you know, are remorseful, but some of them are innocent too. And I promised them all, you know, when I left, I wouldn't forget them and forget about them. So, mm. me, you know, fulfilling that promise. Yeah. Um, 
I had a question from a Facebook um, a Facebook fan. The question was, what do you um, what do you miss, or or what do you think back fondly on your life before prison, like the, the years before you were in prison? Oh, there's all types of stuff. Yeah. I used to um, dream all the time, like when I was waiting on my trial and. and before I was getting out, I used to dream about my dog bear and my cat Charlie and oh. like one of the Ozzy that, that they'd be, you know, waiting on me, you know, when I got home. <laughs> yeah. But it just took too long, but uh, I missed <laughs> him. But we got kittens. We yeah. got kittens. Now, oh. I'm getting a iguana. Yeah. And we'll get a dog when we get a big yard, but yeah. Yeah. Oh, cute. Dog said that when we have kids, we can put a saddle on it and the toddlers can ride around. <laughs> right. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.